Well, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a honor to be uh, invited to this event. And thank you, Simon, for the organization of the event as well. Um, so today we'll, we'll move on to present issue of plant health. And this presentation as well will be slightly uh, more molecular. So I'm a plant scientist and uh, as a plant biologist, plant biology is often seen as a poor child of biology. And a lot of funding is actually going into biomedicine, um, mainly to, to solve the fear that humans have to die. But uh, before having cancer or dying of uh, contagious diseases, uh, we, no one would be able to basically to live here, live our plants. And I have a slide that often when I uh, speak to, to biomedicine students or to colleagues or immunologists, just to remind everyone of the importance of plants. They provide the oxygen, which I learned to, to breathe, for photosynthesis. But most importantly, and this is the topic of this presentation, they provide us with food and most of the drinks uh, that we like uh, to enjoy. Materials, this uh, room, for example, all of the material which around us at some point came from plants. Uh, fuel, as well. And, and finally, high-end product, such as uh, often produced by secondary metabolites of plants that provide uh, the basis for cosmetic or drugs, at least initially, before they get synthesized uh, in some cases. So coming back to food, one of the, probably the most important challenge of this century is how we maintain food security, or in other words, how we be able to feed an uh, ever-growing population, which is believed to reach 9 billion uh, by 2050. And there are a lot of articles written in specialized or more uh, global uh, publications, such as here, I think, from The Economist. And um, there is this gap based on our current actual practices, or now, based on current production, we will be able to uh, feed this population, especially in, uh, in developing countries. So this is basically identified, uh, illustrated here in uh, uh, intensive agriculture, whether we agree or not which is required to, to feed, indeed, this developing country. And this is mostly led by the appetite that these countries have, for example, for meat, and to have a similar lifestyle that we enjoy. This is actually a field in Brazil. It's several kilometers uh, wide. And it's a classical monoculture in Brazil. All of this field is actually to grow soybean, which ultimately we use for, uh, to feed cattle for meat production. To give you an idea of the scale, of such field. Here's a picture where you will see a number of tractors here that will collect the soybean. Every of this single tractor is actually larger than any tractor you've probably ever seen in your life in your nearby field. And what you see here, just behind, is actually tractors which are plowing the soil for immediately replanting the next crop for the next season. And in this kind of environment, and also with the richness of the soil, several rotation of the crop actually possible uh, within a single year. This is also uh, enabled by the use of uh, chemicals, uh, fertilizers, but also in this case fungicide. And the reason we need so many fungicide applications in such an environment in the monoculture is because of a single disease, a single fungus, which is causing this devastating disease here, which is called Asian soybean rust, which is called by this fungus here, Pacosphora pachyriza. So this is just a good illustration of the importance that plant pathogen can have on agriculture, but also the impact they can have on the economics, but also on the environment. And at the moment, just controlling the single disease in Brazil costs several billions of dollars every single year. This is not the only disease which has a global impact on agriculture. Here is actually seven diseases which a few years ago have been highlighted in an issue of science and has called the uh, sort of seven arms and dangerous diseases. Some of them are fungi, some others are mycetes. The one of them here is actually a parasitic plant and this will be the focus of the presentation of Ken uh, later in this session. Some of them infect global crops such as wheat and soybean whereas yeah, some of them affect staple crops, which are very important for certain regions of the world, such as banana here, or cassava a bit here on the right. More recently, uh, a group of uh, scientists in UK, uh, led by Fisher uh, and colleagues, have actually published this article in Nature, where basically they have listed 
uh, the major diseases which are affecting the major crops worldwide. In the same way that medical doctors will um, start their presentation by stating how many uh, thousands or millions of lives, lives are lost every single year because of a disease or particular cancer, what they have tried to do here is to calculate the losses caused by these fungal uh, diseases or disease caused by raw mice in pathogen. And they have tried to put a cost in terms of human lives based on, the, on these crop losses. And they have come up with this number that if one would be able to solve these diseases here, this is just a, again a selection of diseases which are affecting crop production worldwide, one could easily feed between half a billion to four billion of human every single year. The number of four billion is probably another generation, another exagger exaggeration, sorry, but the true figure is probably somewhere in between. And this is already a staggering number if you think or if you compare this number of lives that could be saved uh, and if you relate that to uh, death caused by cancer, for example, every single year. So, as a field, uh, I'm a plant pathologist or a molecular plant pathologist, if one prefer. One has to come to the realization that we need to understand the molecular basis of plant immunity in the same way that we need to understand our cancer, for example, uh, diverse, in order to be able to solve the impact that plant diseases have on crop production. And this was highlighted in this commentary uh, published now four years ago. But it's something which has been embraced by the community and certainly by our own research institute. As Simon mentioned, I work at the Century Lab in, in Norwich, which is a, a privately funded institute by the Gatsby Charitable Foundation. Our main mission is to make fundamental discoveries in the field of plant micro interaction, molecular plant micro interaction. But recently, about six or eight years ago, we have embraced this vision that now that we have a basic understanding on how the plant immune system is working and how our plant pathogen are basically um, interfering with this immune system to cause disease, that we can try to use this knowledge to deliver solutions that reduce crop losses. And we call this the TSL Plus program. All of that is underpinned by cutting edge technologies, which is key uh, to our discoveries. And also, we aim to provide an outstanding training environment for the next generation of scientists. And this relates to what David has presented early on how to make uh, scientists uh, scientific citizens, if you want, but also for some of them entrepreneurs. I'll come back to that at my last slide in the presentation. Just to give you a brief overview. Uh, we are a rather small institute. In total, we are about 100 scientists. We are small in terms of the number of groups. We are six uh, group leaders, which are listed here, covering different aspects of interaction between plant and the pathogen. When we, we are lacking uh, certain knowledge or specialty or technique within our institute, we are trying to recruit such uh, knowledge in nearby institute, and we have really, really close collaboration with other research institutes on the campus, the Norwich Research Park. We co-employ them, for example, in this case here, where we employ Senia Kassileva, joining with the Erlang Institute, this Plant Genomic Institute, which has been recently created at the Norwich Research Park. And also, we have a number of adjunct faculty from the nearby Joint Center covering field as diverse as here structural biologists to weed genetic, or here uh, Saskia, who is a specialist in insect uh, plant interaction. I mentioned that technology is extremely important for our research, and we invest enormously in technologies such as bioinformatics, proteomics, uh, plant transformation, which is essential to test our hypothesis, and also synthetic biology, mostly about uh, genome engineering and how to edit plant genome to test our hypothesis. So this is a very simplistic slide of our current understanding of the concept behind plant immunity. I will not go through the detail of the slide. The only important fact here is that plants are really a very sophisticated and sensitive immune system, which similarly to us, to our own immune system, is applying receptors to perceive molecules which are present in microbes or pests, and therefore which are signaling non self to the plant. There are two types of immune receptors in plant. Some of them are the suffix of the cell here, and the other are inside the cell. And both of them are actually analogous to some of the immune receptors, which are the basis of our own 
non-self perception system, which is the basis of our innate human system. So within the sensory lab, we're actually studying all the aspects of the plant immune system and our plant pathogen actually remodeling this plant immune system to cause disease, discover uh, the activation of this immune receptor, but also understanding how plant pathogen can create long-lasting interfaces between plant cell and their own um, uh, uh, cells, if you want, to cause an established disease. And how ultimately all of that will uh, impinge on immune signaling with plant. In my own research, we're actually concentrating on this class of immune receptor at the surface of the cell that will recognize any non-cell determinant produced by microbes or pests. And actually, plants have an extremely sophisticated and sensitive system for these non-cell molecules. And here are a few of them listed. Again, this slide is not to provide you details, but it's just to illustrate the diversity of the molecules that can be recognized by the plant immune system. Diversity in terms of the origin. This can be classical plant pathogens, such as allmycete, fungi, bacteria, viruses. But now, as so in recent years, it has been discovered that animals are also recognized by the plant immune system, such as, as insect or nematode, or even other plants, which are in this case seen as plant pathogen. And here again, mentioning parasitic plant that can will present later on in this session. Importantly, plants can also perceive molecules for themselves, we call them danger signals. These are molecules from the plant which normally are not available for recognition, but will get produced, for example, in response to wood. This is again analogous to the way by, our, by which our innate immune system can be activated. And it is a recognition of all these different molecules, which can be sugars, lipids, or protein, by specialized immune receptor on the surface of the plant cell that will activate this first layer of immune system in plant. We now know uh, an increasing number of this receptor at the molecular level. This is actually uh, the most recent uh, summary of such receptors. This are, uh, is from a review that is currently in press that we have uh, recently finalized. And again, there are uh, diverse type of molecules at the molecular level which are involved in this perception with different biochemical nature of the main involved in this direct recognition of this molecule that I summarized before. I just want to illustrate here one of our projects. Actually, the majority of our work is to try to understand at the molecular level how these immune receptors are working and which components are involved in, in the signaling class 3 of this receptor. But here, I just wanted to illustrate that we can use this receptor to engineer disease resistance in crops. And this is based on our work on a classical immune receptor that we identified over 10 years ago, which is localized at the, past, uh, at the surface of the plant cell. It's a classical receptor kinase, which basically coupled within a single molecule perception to the activation of the swing signaling, and recognize an extremely conserved protein from bacteria, which is present in most bacteria. It's actually one of the, uh, um, sorry, uh, the major protein that one can find in bacteria cell, proposing up to 90% of the total protein in bacteria cell. It has an extremely important function for bacteria, so bacteria cannot simply get rid of this protein, therefore the perfect target for recognition to activate the immune system. And one feature of this receptor that we identify in the model plant, which is our Arabidopsis thaliana, is that it recognizes this extremely conserved protein for bacteria, but the receptor itself is an innovation, an evolutionary innovation from one family of plant, which is a grazy case family, the mustard family. Uh, which include cabbage, for example. So, based on this uh, observation that this immune receptor is very important for basic cases, the cabbage family, but is not present in our family of plants, we wanted to test the proof of concept if we could transfer this immune receptor from the cabbage family to other families of plants. So, we have done that, and uh, as one example, we have, for example, transferred this immune receptor from this model plant which is called Arabidopsis thaliana, which is a crazy casing, to a solanaceae plant, a crop plant, in this case, tomato. And what we have found is that the receptor biochemically was functional, it was accumulating, it could recognize its ligand, and so now we're in a position to test whether the recipient plant became more resistant to pathogens which are normally able to infect this plant. 
In this case, we use uh, a very important pathogen of plant, which is a soil bacterium, which is called Barstonia solanacea, which is causing what is called bacterial field. The phenotype is basically as if you formulate it towards the plant, and therefore the plant is dying of wilt. Tomato is extremely sensitive to this bacteria, as you can see here. This is a wild type cultivated tomato, only maker. And in tomato, when we express a single immune receptor for cabbage, we can see that the plant became much more resistant than the wild type tomato. We have now performed field trials in the US and Florida. And what you can see here is the commercial tomato variety, which is highly sensitive to this soil bacteria. And in the line where we express the single immune receptor from cabbage, you can see that then these tomatoes are much more resistant to this particular bacterial diseases. And over the, the course of the, of the season, this more than double the total yield of tomato in this particular field. We have now expanded this approach to a number of crops, which include tomato, potato, apple, citrus, where we are currently performing this assay. This is all the bacteria, bacteria to which this immune receptor has been confirmed uh, to confer resistance against in these different studies. And what is common between all these different approaches is that all of these crops suffer from important bacterial diseases for which there is no chemical or genetic control available. And also for many of these particular crops, classical breeding strategy would be very difficult and thereby the use of transgenic approach, as the one that I'm illustrating here, may be better accepted by the public. So now we have shown that indeed we could transfer a immune receptor from one family of plants to many different families of plants, as illustrated here. There is a big divide in the, the, the plant phylogeny between dicots and monocot plants, which include cereals, for example. And what we have shown is that not only we can move the immune receptor between different families, but now we have shown that we can move immune receptor between different classes of plant, and we have shown that we can move an immune receptor between a dicot plant and monocot, and we have illustrated that by transferring this particular immune receptor into rice and into wheat, where it is also conferring increased disease resistance. In addition, what we have done is that we have used an immune receptor, in this case from rice, a monocot plant, and this receptor is called x 21 is actually using classical breeding strategy to confer disease resistant against an important bacterial disease, which is called Xanthomonas oryzae oryzae, and we are transferring to dicot plants, Arbidopsis thaliana, with also tobacco, and shown to be functional and to confer disease resistance against bacteria. In addition, this is an unpublished work. As I mentioned, we have also transferred EFR into apple. And apple is suffering uh, from an important bacterial disease is caused by this bacterium, Erwinia milopora, and this disease is called fire blight. It is called as such because once infected, the plant looks as if it went through a fire, as you can see here. This is a classical apple plant, it's a wild type plant. The infection was performed here, and you see that the rest of the plant immediately died within a few days. And the plant that expressed the single immune receptor from the, uh, the cabbage plant, or the italiana here, are uh, becoming resistant to this bacterial infection. The infection was performed here and here, but you see that the rest of the plant then remain alive. And we are now hoping to uh, perform field trials with this plant to confirm that this is actually working with field conditions. So while we have pioneered the, the use of this transfer of immune receptor between different families to confer disease resistance, this has now been performed by a number of groups uh, worldwide with their own immune receptor that they have been studying. And here are a few examples of such approaches. And this is becoming uh, an approach which is of great interest to, uh, to industry to indeed uh, confer disease resistance in plants by basically using their own immune receptor by simply moving an immune receptor from one family of plant to another, or actually one species of plant to another. So making use of the plant on innate immune system. We know from plant genomes that they have the potential to encode a number of these immune receptors, but as I illustrated earlier on, we only know about two dozen of such immune receptors. So we see the potential to identify a number of these immune receptors which could be used in such approaches to engineer disease resistance in crops. And as many groups around the world, we are actively involved in uh, ways to identify this immune receptor. 
why we're using genetic as often has been used to identify such new receptors. But also over the recent years, we have invested a lot in developing biochemical approaches to identify such new receptors. And this is based on our work on immune signaling, where we know more, for example, um, on the way that such new receptors get activated by co-receptors. And we can use this co-receptor to actually go fishing, if you want, for the immune receptor, then using proteomic approach to identify uh, which receptors are coming along these co-receptors in the presence of specific ligand, or actually to use the ligand themselves um, as a, uh, to go fishing, if you want, as molecular bait, to actually identify which receptor will directly bind to this ligand. And all of, both of these approaches are using proteomics, which is one area where our institute is investing a lot. In addition, recently, this is with funding from industry, we have uh, uh, started using high throughput assays in cell-based assays to actually screen at a very large scale um, all potential immune receptors encoded by plant uh, genome to directly go and identify immune receptors that will be functional against a specific disease which target important crops. So the problem is, this is just one strategy to confer disease resistant crops. And we have learned from history, and this is for classical breeding approaches, that often the strategy deployed by themselves would be easily defeated by the pathogen, which raises a question of durability. How durable the strategy will be once it is employed in the field? And so as an institute, this is something that we are thinking a lot. And we believe that we can combine different modes of actions in crops to increase the chance of durability. I've illustrated in my presentation one way that we can confer disease resistance by using the surface uh, immune receptors. Many of my colleagues are actually trying to identify intracellular immune receptors of plants and developing technologies to identify them in plant genome and also wide related to of crops and to combine these two types of immune receptors into a single crop to make the resistance more durable against important pathogens. This is a free publication that came back to back from our institute uh, last year, Nature Biotechnology, where some of my colleagues have used novel technologies to identify such immune receptors in wide relative of crops and the transfer into the relevant crops. In addition, another colleague, in this case, Sofian Kamun, has developed new ways of capitalizing on genome editing, the ability that we now have to perform very small mutation in plant, in plant and other animal genome with extreme uh, uh, pre uh, preciseness to actually uh, mutate genes which are required for the pathogen to infect the plant. And this is such an illustration here in tomato where simply removing a very small piece of DNA in the tomato genome is actually sufficient to confer full resistance to an important form of pathogen of tomato. And so at the moment, as an institute, we have uh, an approach in collaboration with, with industry to try to combine this different strategy to indeed fight off disease and hopefully in a way that will be durable. So I'm speaking of the present uh, session, but just to think, looking about the future, this is really important for the audience because uh, our future is actually uh, even more closely aligned with UEA. We have recently finalized our vision document, scientific and strategic vision document for the next funding cycle. We always work with five-year funding cycle and this one will start in 2019. And we aim there to be an institute that indeed will benefit from going from the lab to the field but then back. And as we learn from what we have learned uh, into the field and how this could influence our work in the lab and vice versa. Also to think at a more global level and with the aim of becoming a global plant health institute that will tackle existing major diseases, but also importantly, diseases which are constantly emerging. And, and recently, there were a number of emerging diseases, both in UK, fungal diseases affecting tree, ash dieback, but also here in Asia, the emergence of a new weed disease, uh, weed blast, which is targeting uh, wheat in Bangladesh, and now let's move on to India, which are major wheat production areas in Asia. This concept of lab to field and back is what we call a, 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 a dynamic and iterative discovery impact feedback loop. And that's all the realization that as scientists and as an academic research institution, we are pretty equipped to actually move our discovery from the lab to the field and to develop a product. 
So very early on in our, in our project, we, we had tried to develop partnerships with in the international organization, non-for-profit organization, such as the Two Blaze Foundation, which I've uh, listed before in one of my slides, but also UN-funded organizations, such as CGIR Institute, with whom we have very close collaboration, but also industry, because they are still the best equipped to develop a product and to bring it to the field, but also to interact with decision makers uh, and farmers, and this is maybe uh, a gap that we currently have in our strategy. I mentioned strategic collaboration, and one of them, which is very close to our interest, it's a non-for-profit non, non organization, which is based in the US, called the Two Blades Foundation, but also closer alignment with our local partners and the Norwich Research Park, the university to start with, not only the School of uh, Biological Sciences, but also the School of Environmental Sciences, and maybe the business school to try to develop models on our best to, to develop product and also to understand the problem that small uh, farmers may have in the European country and the other institute on our campus, the Joyner Center, for example, and the Erlan Institute. Talking about closer link with UEA, we are also in the process of uh, developing a new master program on molecular plant micro interaction, which maybe would help us all uh, attract international students, potentially from Japan. And also, coming back to uh, David's presentation, the importance of entrepreneurship. This is something we had realized a few years ago where we, with closer partnership with industry, maybe our students, our scientists were fully equipped to actually understand the, the private sector. And so we have established a, a master class. We just finished the first year of this master class, uh, funded both by our institution, but also the Two Place Foundation, on bioentrepreneurship, where uh, scientists that we we choose from our own pool of scientists will get trained in how to set up a company, for example, how to write a patent, how to protect intellectual property, and potentially how to become the next entrepreneur and maybe developing the next uh, startup company uh, on the Norwich Research Park or actually beyond. So with that, as it is uh, common, I just want to thank uh, the people in, in, my, in my own group but also all of my colleagues at TSA briefly presented uh, some of his work. Our funding, as I mentioned, uh, most of our funding is coming from the Get Mission Rotable Foundation, but we heavily depend on EU funding, such as the European Research Council, and I mentioned Two Blaze Foundation, which is a close partner. Um, my own group, has, uh, as of my colleagues, have many international collaborators, but uh, one collaborator I want to mention here is Ken Chirazu, who will give the next presentation, and also Yasuru Kadota, who is also sitting in the room, who came as a postdoc in my group a few years ago, and is now a staff scientist and we can be working with Ken. And actually this collaboration started uh, at the same time as my lab 10 years ago, and this was with funding from the Royal Society, and also um, we had a, a lot of support from JSPS uh, in, in the years after, at the institute level in my lab, where for example we funded uh, Yasuru uh, State Library. So thank you very much.